Whether you're looking for answers to specific life questions or seeking to become the best version of you possible, welcome to the Mental Breakdown and Psych Reg podcast, where we offer insight, information, and strategies based upon research and years of practice as clinical psychologists. So sit back, have a listen, and get connected with our hosts, Dr. Bernie Wilkinson and Dr. Richard Marshall. Welcome back. Richard, today we're going to talk about teen anxiety. It's, it's, not, it's not a new topic for us, but there was this great article that came out in the New York Times Magazine right. uh, just recently, mm-hmm. in um, early October, mid-October right. of uh, this year, written by uh, Benoit Denizet Lewis. I would Lewis. say Benoit. You would? Well, my, my children had a teacher. Benoit? And her last Benoit. name was B-E-N-O-I-T, and it was pronounced Benoit. Okay. So I, that... You know what? This is a recurring theme. <clears throat> That I mm. just am not sure how to pronounce names, but it's right. Benoit then Denizet Lewis. Lewis. Right. And mm-hmm. it's it's a wonderfully written article entitled Why Are More American Teenagers Than Ever Suffering from Severe Anxiety? Right. And this is a debilitating anxiety. Right. This this is not um, garden variety, I'm a little anxious anxiety. Mm-hmm. This is debilitating anxiety that requires fairly in, no, very intensive mm-hmm, mm-hmm. inpatient treatment. Right. Um, but that said, th- that it requires that it's very severe anxiety. It begins with anxiety that most of many of us have seen right. in children, and that right. you and I see on a regular basis in our right. clinics, is that children come in with low-level anxiety, and in many cases it doesn't progress, but in some cases it might. And right. so I think there's a caution here mm-hmm. that if your children, especially if they're beyond elementary school age, mm-hmm. I mean, many children have have um, anxiety about school right, right. when they're when they're little, but that usually disappears by late elementary, mm-hmm. early middle school. If it doesn't, and that's what happened to these kids, right. is that they had the symptoms. Yeah, they worsened. Uh, they they got worse over time, and they ended up with truly debilitating anxiety by the time they got to high school. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so what we're going to do on the podcast today is now, this is a, this is a a full length article. We would not call this a blog. No, you know, we we talked about that last week. The difference no. between an article and a blog. This is not a blog. This is a full article, and they go into wonderful detail. And some of that detail we're going to talk about today, but what I was thinking, what we would that we would talk about is. First, kind of go through, uh, as you were just saying, sort of the difference between generalized mild levels of anxiety that many, many teenagers will feel about tests and things like mm-hmm. that to, mm-hmm. to severe anxiety and talk a little bit about the different ways in which anxiety can manifest. Right. It's a little like depression. You know, everybody has the blues. You have the right. blahs once in a while, but, it, but it's not clinical depression. Right, right. Anxiety is the same thing. All right. of us get anxious mm-hmm. on occasion, right. um, but it's not a debilitating um, anxiety. Right. This is right. what we're talking about today is. Right. So, and she did do a wonderful article. It's very comprehensive. It's lengthy, yeah. as many of the Times articles are. But it's a very complete treatment right. of the topic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're going to talk a little bit about the, those differences in anxiety. Uh, the, way, the different ways in which anxiety may manifest. The different ways in which it's going to present and right. the different types of behaviors that we may see from that. And then talk a little bit about what parents are to do. Because I think, and, and that's what we titled the, pod, the, the podcast for today is, you know, t- with teen anxiety, uh, do we overprotect them or do we push them? And, and that is that is a big question that a lot of parents ask. There are several themes mm-hmm. that we want to we want to talk about um, in today's podcast. Uh, one of them is the alarming uh, uh, rise in the incidence right. of severe anxiety, mm-hmm. um, but the other is what's a parent to do because there's this. Um, complicated calculus that you're going right. to have to do about wanting to help your child, mm-hmm. but not um, not reach a point where you're actually making it worse. Right. Where where in trying to accommodate and be flexible, mm-hmm. you're actually making the anxiety worse. So right. we'll talk about that when we get to that section. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so first this this briefly talk then about sort of the difference between the anxiety we're kind of talking about today and as you said sort of the garden variety mm-hmm. anxiety garden variety anxiety is the anxiety that we all experience you right. know when you when you're going for a 
when a teenager is going to get a te- take a test or mm-hmm. when they have to take the SAT or when they try out for a sports team right um, um, school play the first day of school right. um, you know f- for adults that's you know I- anytime you're going out for a job interview or any of those kinds of things that stress that anxiety that you feel during those times that's that's mm-hmm. normal very common um, anxiety that you feel and we, we, we refer to it sort of um, nonchalantly like that because typically, mm-hmm. typically, we overcome that anxiety and we get done what we need to get done. That's right. We call it anxiety. Right. But we don't mean it. We don't. It's we're not, not making a clinical diagnosis. Right. We, we just say you know, you're feeling anxious. And most of that kind of is situational. Right. You know, you're, you're taking a test. You're trying out for a team. You're trying out for your interviewing for high school right. placement in a magnet school or a charter school. So those are situ- that's situational anxiety. We right. still call it anxiety. We don't mean it as a clinical diagnosis. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And we've talked before, there, we have previous podcasts where we've talked about and differentiated stress from worry, from anxiety. And, right. and so, again, recognizing that all of those things are a little bit different, and, and this anxiety is a little bit different than the impairing anxiety that we're going to talk about throughout the rest of this right. podcast, because impairing anxiety means that the anxiety gets so significant that you can't do some of the things you need to do. That's right. Another good example would be flying on an airplane, Mm -hmm. um, especially in these days. I don't fly often, as often as I used to. And when I do fly, there's always a little anxiety. Mm -hmm. There's a low level of anxiety of all the things that might go wrong and the planes are usually very full. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, So you experience this anxiety. But I can get on the plane. Right. And we're talking about people who cannot, who are, whose anxiety is so severe that they can't get on the aircraft. Right, right. Yeah, I'm listening to a, a podcast. Um, it it's, has nothing to do with psychology, but it's called Somebody Knows Something. And it's from uh, CBC, from the Canadian Broadcast Channel or something like that. And it's sort of these reviewing uh, old murder cases and things like that. And so they're kind of going through it and uh, looking at oh, new information. Oh, Somebody Knows Something. Yeah. Okay. Good uh, title. And it's a fantastic yeah. title. And and the, the show is, is really interesting but he was just talking about in the episode i was listening to yesterday he was just talking about how he had a near crash experience in a plane oh. and so now he drove from canada to mississippi that's a drive we would say that's a fair piece that's a that's a long <laughs> so he drive. didn't have to so he because he would not he didn't want oh, to fly. he won't fly he won't fly don uh mad john madden John, right. He's another one. That's why he never covered the Pro Bowl because the Pro Bowl was always held in the in Hawaii and couldn't he, get there. he couldn't get there. Right. So and and over the Thanksgiving games, he would always have that big. Um, they had like a camper, right, in right, Winnebago. Yeah. And they would have that eight leg turkey, the spider yeah. turkey. Yeah. Had more, turducken. 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 They would eat the turducken, right? I don't know. They, but it had more legs on it than more. It had yeah. more than two legs. Right. Right. On, on the turkey, but yes, he's another one who's afraid of. Yeah. Uh, who's, who will not fly. But that, but so that's the kind of anxiety we're talking about, and and flying is a is not the best of examples because how many how often do you fly, you right. know? So, but we're talking about that level of interference, but on somewhat of a daily basis. But that's right, not just yeah. per situation. Right, it's with you all the time. Right, right. So let's talk then a little bit about the the rise in anxiety. Right. You know. They, oh yeah, the prevalence rates. Yeah. So wow, th- these numbers are pretty impressive. They're alarming. Yeah. Um, for which I have to put my glasses on. You put your glasses on. It's not nice to tease people. I'm not teasing. But there. Okay. So you've got them written down. I have them written down. I want to make sure I get this right because I was really surprised by this. Um, colleges do studies. Right. And they interview their freshmen because they want to collect these data. So the entering freshman class mm-hmm. at a university. How many of you feel overwhelmed about right. entering this experience? In 1985, right. 18% said they felt overwhelmed. Okay. In 2010, it was 29%. Okay. Six years later, the last time we collected data in 2016, it was 41%. Wow. So we've gone from 18%. 18% to 41%. Yeah. Alarming, alarming numbers. That's a, that's, a, that's a significant rise. Right. The other statistic that we found interesting was when they asked college students um, of, at different levels of, it, of uh, the experience, not just freshmen, how many of you are feeling overwhelming anxiety? Mm-hmm. So the, 
so now we're up a little so bit. So not just level. a little nervous about the process, right. but overwhelming anxiety. Overwhelmed by your anxiety. In 2011, about 50% okay. said they were. In 2016, 62%. So yeah. we're talking, what's that, like two out of three? Right. Yeah. Are feeling overwhelming anxiety? Yeah. That affects you every day? Right. That's all. Yeah. That's, a, that's a lot of our students. I mean, and, you and I teach in colleges. Right. And when I think of my class of 30 students, 20 of them yeah. are, are feeling overwhelming anxiety. Yeah. It, it's, it's difficult to accept. Not that it's difficult to accept. It's difficult to wrap your brain around that, that there would there be that many students. Now, of course, we could, if this, was, if this podcast was on a different topic, we could go into all kinds of different hypotheses as to why this increase is happening, whether it's the parenting stuff, you know, right. parenting issues or the uh, educational issues. But it makes you wonder, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, is it something about the systems right. that we've created? And we're, I want to talk about that a little mm-hmm. bit. Or is it something about the, ch- the, the students themselves? Right. Are, are we creating wimps? You know, there right. was an article right, right. not long ago in time. I think it was entitled A Nation of Wimps. Yeah, okay. something like that. Are we raising children who don't have the fortitude, the intestinal fortitude, the courage, mm-hmm. the resilience, the energy to overcome obstacles? Or are the systems such that they just have this crushing effect on people mm-hmm. no matter right. uh, what age, no matter right. what what time? So that I'd like to talk about a little. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in a, in a, in what effect does this have? You know, is is part of that is part of that overwhelming stress? You know, contribute to the reason that a, a large number of college students don't graduate. Well, I we tend to think in terms of college students, right? And the college application process has become anxiety producing. Yeah. And sure. when I applied to college, we just filled out an application in pencil and sent it in. Pencil? Well, no, no. Don't make any comments about when I applied to college. No, it was a much different process then. Right. Okay. Today's students, I mean, this whole thing about, well, I'm going to apply to 20, I'm going to make mm-hmm. 20 applications. Right. And each one has a uh, an essay that you have mm-hmm. to write. And it, each one has different requirements. Right. And you're applying for scholarships. Mm-hmm. And there's this, and parents tell me about uh, the dining room table is set up for college applications mm-hmm. and, and everything is organized. Right. Um, okay, so we can talk about kids applying to college, but where we live, most kids don't go to college. Right. But they're still experiencing some kind of anxiety. Right. And so while the college application process might explain some of the increase, mm-hmm. it doesn't explain all of it because most kids aren't applying to college. Right. And it doesn't explain why we're seeing the significant increase in um, in tenth graders yeah, who are still years out from And we're talking about teenagers, right. now, young teenagers right. who are experiencing this. So the college application process, though, um, difficult and mm-hmm. frustrating and anxiety producing mm-hmm. can't be the only explanation. Right. Okay. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, so let's then dig into that a little bit. Right. Certainly there are hypotheses that, um, our parenting styles are contributing to that. You know, we, right. we've talked, uh, some might argue, um, overly talk <laughs> about different parenting styles and the effects of those parenting styles. We just did a, a podcast a couple of weeks ago on, mm-hmm. you know, the fact that uh, kids of helicopter parents are failing. They're they're really falling and 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 um, having a difficult time managing entering into adulthood and and those kinds of transitions because they're they've been so protected and. Right. Success has been so engineered. Yeah, we talked about helicopter parents and lawnmower parents. Right. You know, and, and how they um, protect their children from disappointment right. and, and handle their children's challenges and handle their children. They, they help their children either clear, the, right. clear them out of the way or come to their rescue. Right. And as a result, kids are becoming uh, less able right. to withstand disappointment right. or failure. And that uh, podcast just went out just a, a just few days ago. Few that days. was Tuesday from this, this past week. Right, right. And so so are parents contributing? Well, right. 
not all parents are helicopter parents. Right. You know, well, I, you're right. It's certainly not sixty-two percent. Not sixty-two percent are right. not helicopter parents. So that's not a that's not a um, sufficient um, explanation right. for why we see the rise in anxiety. Right. Uh, another possible explanation would just be genetics. Um, right. You know, we we have that in our workshops. We talk about the influence of genes. Um, people who how, how to say this. People who are anxious are oftentimes drawn to people who are anxious. Right. And so now you have two yeah. anxious people creating offspring who are going to be anxious. Right. And yeah. so... Yeah, he understands me. Right, so, right. Because I'm anxious, he understands me. So now you have two people. Exactly. So you have right. two people who, are cre who may create two or three or four people right. who are anxious. Because as with all ADHD or depression or anxiety, it's in our genes. Right. Okay, the, the, we're supposed to be a little anxious because it's it keeps us alive right. you know you're, you're supposed to experience some anxiety mm -hmm. and some mm -hmm. fear because you have to be cautious mm -hmm. okay but we're talking about ex extending that right. intensifying that to the point where it becomes debilitating exactly right so it's necessary but at some point it becomes debilitating right mm -hmm. a, a third possible explanation is as you said a moment ago the system you know we are creating we are you mean this by system? You, you like the school, school system, system and the and okay. the, you know well I guess well we can put For, society separate but um, mm -hmm. the school system itself you know right. we are we are ever increasing our expectations. Um, we we recently heard that there's a a school in our area mm -hmm. here who has now made algebra, mm -hmm. which is a, typically a, a ninth grade a freshman in high school level course right. has now made algebra the the regular course for sixth grade. Sixth grade. Sixth grade is what I heard. I thought we talked about that. But yes, that's what the message that I got the other day. I was worried about a student who had taken algebra in the seventh grade. Right. And um, I didn't know it was yeah. getting yeah. into sixth grade. So so they are shifting to where algebra is now the regular course in sixth grade. And I remember um, I remember years ago when you and I first started working uh, together, there was a, we, we talked about how some of the schools were starting to introduce algebra even in fourth grade. Remember that uh, yeah. back at that elementary school that we worked at the, in, in fourth grade. So we keep pushing things down. We have kindergartners who are expected to do book reports and we have... They're expected to write sentences and paragraphs right. and to be able to read and... and mm -hmm. um, you know, we've pushed everything down right. um, to earlier and earlier stages. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that type of elevated expectation and, and increased demands, you know, a, a, a consequence of that is anxiety. You know, I did a talk in Arizona last week, and in preparation for that, I was reading a book about um, disruptive children, mm -hmm. uh, students. And the author, uh, the author of that book is Frank Gresham, well-known mm -hmm. in, in that community. Um, and he said, he argues that, uh, what has happened in schools is that we have raised the premium on academic performance, mm -hmm. but we've done it at the expense right. of social development, behavior, emotional development. And we have, we forgot, we have forgotten that, um, we have to nurture all those uh, facets mm -hmm. of students and this um, overemphasis on the academic has been done at the expense of emotional development right. and behavior. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so there are these natural consequences that are happening. Right. And, and it's important that we, we, we have to keep that as a factor. The, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, we have been unsuccessful in changing that, slowing it down even, because it, it seems as though lawmakers and decision makers are ever pushing in that direction and, and until we have some pretty significant changes right. it doesn't look like that's going to slow down um, the, the school that's putting algebra at for sixth grade that's a private school so that that school that's not even a school that's mandated by state law right. to to do meet some of these expectations that's a private school mm. so it, it's concerning um, and, and again see, certainly increases the level of stress and expectation. Right. I think the school systems do. Um, mm -hmm. When my mother talks to us about what it was like raising right. children in, in our day, um, um, 
it wasn't near she doesn't understand mm -hmm. why my children are so stressed about school right. she said what well, I, I don't understand why you why, why this stress why mm -hmm. why are they why do they have to do this why do they have to do that and it just makes no sense to her and she had she put six she raised six children right, right. and uh, she said I don't what what is the point of all mm -hmm, of this? Mm -hmm. Because their kids are not. I don't think they're doing. I don't know that there's any advantage right. in what we've done. Right. But she doesn't understand the pressure, and I keep trying to tell her. Said no, they have to get if they want to go to college. Mm -hmm. She said, well, you guys went to college. Yeah. But it was a very different. We didn't yeah. need to have all A's to go to college. I was just saying when we went to college, <clears throat> the, the the valedictorian. Well, I don't know about when you went to college, but when I went to college, the valedictorian may have had like a four point one or four point two GPA, maybe because of honors classes and stuff had, like that. I don't think our valedictorian had all A's. Right, and so it's so not even having all A's and being the valedictorian in the nineteen twenties to uh, having a four point one maybe 4.2 or so in, in the early 90s. Now, I mean, we have students who are pushing 5, 5.0 on a 4.0 scale. I know one who has over a 6. It, 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 she's a high school student, and she's teaching a college class, a college math class. And so her grade point average is 6.3 or something. And, and, and so... <clears throat> You, you, you have to, there, there's no way to not see. I mean, you would have to, you would have to completely close your eyes to not see the, that this is a, a fertile ground for anxiety. You know, if you, if you know that you're going up, going up against, put that in shutter quotes, that, um, you know, your application is competing against somebody else's application and they have a 6.0 GPA out of 4.0, well, and they probably got a sixteen hundred. Uh, well, sixteen hundred is the highest you can get, so they probably have a seventeen or eighteen hundred on the <laughs> SAT. Right. Um, but you you just don't. That, that's no. that's tremendously anxious. And from what I understand, most of the flagship universities in each state there's mm -hmm. one the University of Michigan, University yeah. of Florida, University of Texas, University of Pennsylvania, are all very they're highly selective right. colleges. I was reading through a list of. Uh, the most selective colleges mm -hmm. in the country, and many of them are these flagship universities. Right. They're not just Harvard and Yale and the Ivy Leagues, but the, and they're even state universities. These are state universities right. who are who are in that list of mm -hmm. thirty or forty most selective. I mean, you mm -hmm. understand Brown or Bowdoin or some of these smaller right. elite academies. You understand it there, but these are just large state universities mm -hmm. that most students in that state can never get accepted. They can never attend right. because they're far beyond anything mm -hmm. that, that they can. That, yeah. It's far beyond what they've done. I mean, the the average <clears throat> GPA, I, th I think it. No, oh, I wish I remember. The University of Florida. Right. What is the average income? High school. GPA? High it's school over four. That's what I thought. That's what. Right. I, yeah, you I, have I, to have I, over a four point right. or don't apply. Right. And and it's becoming that way. What's going to happen is that. Every school that's going to eventually get there mm -hmm. is that Florida State will fill up, right. and then I mean um, the University of Florida will will have a complete entering freshman mm -hmm. class of students who have over four point or above. Well, it's going to reach other universities eventually, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and so it's so it completely changes the dynamics. Again, we can get into we we could get into that in a, in a lot more detail because this is where the, the issue with like community colleges and, and junior colleges and things like that because students who have you know 3.8 GPA uh, a 3.8 GPA they may want to go to a four-year university straight out of high school mm -hmm. but because they have a 3.8 and not a 4.2 right. they're gonna they they will then go to junior college instead of right. straight to a, a, mm -hmm. a four-year university and, and while there's nothing wrong with going to a junior college I went to a community college sure. yeah. um, before I went to USF but, you know, that is, is certainly, uh, again, anxiety provoking, if not for just the simple fact that you, you have these goals and you have these expectations and you're working hard. Right. And you fall short because, you know, you made a couple of Bs. You have a couple of Bs. Right. Yeah. And, and this whole thing, some people say, well, this is great inflation. Right. Now, this isn't driven by grade inflation. This is driven by you have to take honors classes and AP classes, right. and you have to take algebra in sixth or seventh grade. Right. 
so that you could, I don't know, there, there are no math courses left by the time you're a junior. Th- th- this has happened to my son. Right. You know, he, he, took, he took algebra in seventh grade, and, and he is a math kid. You know, you know my son. He's a math kid. He, it's, it's ridiculously easy for him. I don't know why. I mean, math was, math was my thing. Math and science was my thing. He, he, makes, it, he makes it look so easy because um, he just gets it. Mm-hmm. Um, and he'll sit down and he'll plow through it to where he, as a sophomore, <clears throat> he took college algebra as right. a dual enrollment and um, pre-cal algebra through dual enrollment. Mm-hmm. And so he has those two college credits. He made A's in both of those classes. Right. Right. And so, yeah, now as a junior and then as a senior, he has no math classes to take. That's right. That's, that's the other thing you get into. Right. So and so what happens? What, where are, why are we rushing? If right. we had, if there was some payoff. Now, yes, he started early, but that means he has to take college classes in 11th grade. Right. 11th grade or 10th. Yeah. He's in 11th grade. He's half of his Because there are no high school classes, classes left. Mm-mm. Right. No. Now, for him, and we say Taking those college classes was not a stressful experience. Well, the <clears throat> they're right. He he doesn't mind taking them. He does. He can certainly do the work, but it requires skills that he doesn't have. He he hasn't had to learn yet because. What do you? But he's handling uh, it. Uh, yeah, his his high school classes have been. I, I mean, I, I don't want to, and I'm certainly not being braggadocious on my kid or anything like that. But the high school classes have been pretty easy for him. Pretty straightforward. I mean, he makes, right? You know, he ninety six to one hundred. Now, I have a problem with that, in that those high school classes probably should be harder, right? Because there's something, you know, but, every right. kid should not be making an A in, in all these classes. Right. But, um, and, and if that means my kid gets a B, I'm fine with that. Um, but he, these college classes are treated like college classes, right. and so whereas in high school. There's that high school handholding that happens, mm-hmm. um, and those of you who have kids in high school and you don't feel like your kids' hands are being held, wait until they start taking college classes because right. then you start seeing this massive difference. The college professors do not talk to you. You know, he, he has three college professors right now for these three courses he's taking, and they don't respond to me. His high school t- teachers will they don't respond, respond to me. To you. No. Wow. And again, that's fine. So I'm teaching, we have to teach, and those are the skills that I'm talking about. He doesn't have those skills. And so it it creates that kind of anxiety that I have a, you know, he says, I have a test coming up and I have no idea what's going to be on the test because he says it's going to be these things, but we haven't even talked about those things. Um, And as I was preparing for today's podcast, um, I was thinking about the college application process. Mm -hmm. It has become so complicated and so anxiety producing that students, very few students are able to manage the process. Right. They need parental assistance. Right. Okay. And the irony that what my parents didn't even know mm-hmm. that I applied to, I mean, they knew I was applying. Right. They never saw the applications. Um, I guess they paid the bill, mm-hmm. the, probably $10 in those years to, you know, to apply to college. A what week's wages. Now? About... <laughs> ten dollars and a chick and a chicken. Ten dollars and a chicken <laughs> to go to college. So it's a barter system. <laughs> if you didn't have enough money, you could bring them eggs or something. You know, for a basket of fruit. That's fantastic. <laughs> I'll do anything to get my child into this college. Um, but but we've made the process such that students can no longer do it. Right. It takes the executive functioning mm-hmm. of an organized adult. Right. Yeah, absolutely. A literate organize who maybe has already been through the process. Right. If a parent has never been through the college application process, they're going to be of limited mm-hmm. uh, help. Right. Okay. And so when I talk to parents who say, "Well, I have everything is on the dining room table and all the applications are there," those aren't the skills of a typical high schooler. Mm-hmm. Those are the skills of the high schooler's parents. Right. They're managing this whole process. Yeah. Which means, and when we talk about the, is it the system or is it the child? These systems have become very, very complex. Mm-hmm. Getting a driver's license is, com- you know, how, I do this online and I do this here and I right. have to go there. And, right. Um, every, all these systems are becoming more complex. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. But there's another. So we talked about, is it parenting? Right. Maybe. Is it the systems? Right. I think the systems are becoming very complex. I, I think so. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, financial systems, right. health systems, yeah. regardless. 
Athletic systems. Yeah. <laughs> when I when we played sports, mm-hmm. you played in high school. I mean, there yeah. was you might have been in a little league or pony mm-hmm. league baseball team, but most of your sports were played in high school. Right. I then left that world mm-hmm. and was out of it for twelve or thirteen years mm-hmm. before I had my first child. Mm-hmm. So in that say fifteen year period, mm-hmm. suddenly when I re entered with my own children, mm-hmm. I discovered a whole new world. Right. The children had their own bats. Mm-hmm. They had their own catcher's gear. Mm-hmm. They had bags of equipment. Mm-hmm. We had our cleats mm-hmm. yeah. and a glove. Everything else was provided. Yeah. Wooden bats and Right. And and I'm thinking, wait a minute, I have to spend three hundred dollars for a bat? So my child oh, yeah. can play Little League? Got to get a mic in. <laughs> well, you know, the, and, and it's funny that the way that, the, that you're, you're mentioning it that way because I'm about, I'm a little bit older than your oldest. You're, right. You're than your oldest. a few years older than my oldest right. child. Right. Because me growing, <clears throat> when I was growing up, we, we all had our own bats and we had some of those things. Right. Um, but even, but for me, from graduating high school and, and going through that and then having kids and then now having a, a, a kid that goes through athletics the difference now is the the aau um that's you know I, competitive so travel you, teams that's so the big difference that's for me now. So you didn't have that when you were you, in a, okay yeah because when i soccer for example it is i i played a number of sports i played tennis and, and soccer um and, and baseball and some different things through high school and everything but there weren't these things at, at this level so when i talk to kids and they say well how long have you been playing soccer i said well you know i started playing in high school so right. what did, where did you play, you know, rec or competitive? We didn't... You didn't have those. We didn't have that in, in, in the area that I lived. <clears> so <throat> we, we never did that. Like, I thought it was amazing that a, a couple of guys that were on our soccer team went to a summer soccer camp. I was right. like, what in the world what are you talking about? What is a summer about? soccer camp? Yeah. Right. And, and now it's like, that, that's routine. That's regular. And, and so these there kids are traveling There's something I could say, over. but you're going to make fun of me if I say it. What? <laughs> say it. We didn't, we didn't have Little League baseball fields when I first started. Right. We played on a high school field mm-hmm. because there weren't there was no such thing as it. I can remember when I was twelve, mm-hmm. we played our first game on a little league baseball right. field. And right. I'd never been in one before. Yeah. And I thought, wow, this looks so small because we had been playing on the high school field mm-hmm. where we lived. Um, so um, I was shocked when I saw kids carrying all their this bag of equipment mm-hmm. and in little league, and then the AAU. Right. Uh, what is it, amateur athletic union? Yeah, something like that. Okay, that kids start very young, mm-hmm. and then it and wasn't. Traveling. It wasn't just rec. Now you have these travel teams, right, for the elite athletes. Right. Okay. And parents and, are spending thousands of dollars. And if you have the year. money to do it, right, you know, because not everybody can afford to make right. those weekly trips and stay in hotels. Right. And you know, we we know people who have bought um, their own, not a Winnipeg. A huge yeah campers and like a bus right okay but it mm-hmm. can, they're like three hundred thousand dollars or something yeah oh I you have that kind of, no you do that but. yeah you know what I mean no but so even we sleep in even the back of the kid, truck <laughs> give it a but you're sleeping truck. back back there a pickup truck with a tarp <laughs> um, so even athletic systems have become far more complex mm-hmm. than they were. Yeah. Even when you were growing right. up, you know. Yeah, well, you know, again, not to belabor this too much, but with baseball, you know, I remember when I when, when I was in high school, we had a player go from high school to the minor leagues, mm-hmm. and everybody was like, "Wow, you know, this is fantastic." I mean, the guy, the kid was he was a good ball player. Mm-hmm. Now, that can't happen unless you're, you know, if you're a pitcher. It's not likely to happen unless you're right-handed and throwing close to 100 miles per hour. As a high school student. As a high school student. That's right. Or you're left-handed throwing in the 90s. Right. That's right. You know, and you're over six feet tall. Right. Mm-hmm. And you, you have like, you know, approaching 300 batting average. You know, it's, right. it's the, the expectations. Not that, and I don't think that I have a, a real problem with that, except that what happens is, these kids have been massaged all through childhood that, right. you know, you keep working and, you know, you can mm-hmm. be a professional player. They, there's, you know, they're in, in other countries where we really kind of look at right. some of these models. 
you know, there, there, there's a kid that's 16 years old that's starting for um, and or playing regularly for you know some Premier League teams and and professional professional soccer teams in in Europe. You know, they're starters and, and they're still teenagers, mm -hmm. the, the age of our high schoolers. So, you know, the the, the probability of you know any particular 16 or 17 year old now um, who's still in high school and not playing professionally right, right. attaining that it, you know it's the, the probability starts to really get small, small. but they hold right. on to that expectation that and oh that if I dream, just keep right you know, I'm going to play in the NFL I'm going to play in the major right. leagues you know and so it's it's really really tough mm -hmm. and it does create a lot of anxiety right so so it could be that the systems we've created mm -hmm. Um, that children are, are have this acute anxiety because they feel the pressure. Right, mm -hmm. right. So I, I think you know, we're we, we've beaten that up uh, enough now. Uh, the, the, we could probably keep going. We could keep more going. with more po we can. possible causes. But but we, but the, we have the so we're thinking about the cause. There's one more. Okay. With today's teenagers, Go ahead. what would today's teenagers be experiencing that would be stress inducing? Social media. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You know, the, the constant being plugged, constantly being I plugged. I don't in. know what that would be like. Yeah. I can. Um, I've watched my children. Well, I've watched my youngest child. Yes. Because the others were not nearly as affected by it. There's a. There's a. I have a daughter who's 22 and a daughter who's 18. Mm -hmm. The 22 year old had a completely different social media experience right. than the 18 year old had. Right. The 18 year old felt much more anxiety. Right than the 22 year old. And mm -hmm. I don't think it was a difference in their temperaments. I mm -hmm. think it was a difference in what happened to social media right. in that four year yeah. period. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that's certainly a significant stress. So the, the social aspects of things are I can't imagine, increased. kids live in mortal fear mm -hmm. of social media yeah. because you can be destroyed in an instant. It doesn't take you, much. Life could change in, a, in just an instant. One and they're acutely aware of that. typo mm -hmm. could do it, right. yeah. So so let's talk then about... By the way, I saw a 244-character tweet. Yeah. I haven't seen... What, what do you mean? They're raising it from... Oh, right. They're doubling it. Mm -hmm. And one of my students showed me what a... What the... Uh, it's, it, a, it's like an email. Then it's so much to read. I know. <laughs> I just want to be able okay. to scan it real quick. It's an aside. So... I'm, what? That's all I'll say about Twitter. So, <laughs> you, you threw me off with that. So let's talk then about what a parent should do. All right, so do, do we push them or do we protect them? If, if you have a teenager who, right. who's struggling with anxiety at the level that we're talking about, what is the parent to do? And, and the reason that this is such a, a challenge isn't just because it's anxiety. It, it's because the, the remedy for anxiety is exactly the thing and that that perpetuates the anxiety. So if you're anxious about something, the the cure is the cause. Right. It, it, Let so, that sink in. The cure is the cause. Right. So if you're really anxious about doing a presentation, <laughs> you're not going to do the presentation. And by not doing the presentation, it's going to make you more anxious about doing the next presentation. Right. And so the cure for your current anxiety is going to perpetuate and maybe even exacerbate that anxiety at a future time. And you can guess what the solution to this problem is. Just do it. Oh, man. I wish I had, like, the Nike symbol and everything. we got to get this. Oh, if we did, we'd get sued, right? Oh, we would. Without permission. Oh, I, I shouldn't should say Nike. I should have said, like, Nike or something like that. Just change the name just a little bit. Then you can do it. Yeah. Cut the tail off and yeah. swoosh. That's right. Yeah, that's the irony of anxiety is that at whatever age, um, you have to push through it. You have right. to confront. Right. Okay. Um, and there are names for this, these kinds of therapies mm -hmm. that we're talking about, exposure, exposure therapy, you know, right. flooding. Right, right. As the names imply, you have to confront these things. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, that is not, so, so you might hear that and you might say, oh, instead of overprotect, we want to push. Yes and no. You still have to be careful because by pushing too much, you, you can cause damage. In sports, we call it the sweet spot. Right. Um, Goldilocks, Goldilocks mm -hmm. right? It has to be just right, right? And that's where, that's where the difficulty lies. Right. You know, we say the devil is in the details. The mm -hmm. detail here is that 
you have to push, mm -hmm. but you have to push gently. Right. And you have to know how far right. you should push this particular child. Right. Because if you push too far, you're going to create damage. You're going right. to create problems. Right. So we'll just do a quick example. Yeah. So if we think about presentations, a lot of people have a really difficult time getting in front of a class of 30 or 40, 30 mm -hmm. people, say, mm -hmm. and doing a presentation. So how do you push without pushing? Or how do you mm -hmm. make it happen without being um, overly uh, damaging to right. the person? Right. Well, instead of having them present in, in front of 30 people, you have five people. That's and right. so you say, okay, you know, you can come after school and do this, and then you have uh, four or five other students sit and, and, and right. watch the presentation. Mm -hmm. And so you have a, a, a mild, minor type of exposure mm -hmm. to that. And then the next time, there could be 10 people in the audience uh, for the presentation, and you Correct. slowly build up from there. You don't jump right into 30 or 60 mm -hmm. or anything like that. You don't just say either you're going to do it or you're going to fail. Right. You say, this is how we can work through this, and you right. build that exposure over time. That's right. Successive right. approximations. Right. You move gradually toward the goal. Right. And you can take any example at any age. For right. example, very young children who decide they don't want to go to school. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, We used to call that school phobia. Right. You know, it's really a separation anxiety. Um, and you have to insist. Mm -hmm. Or even younger than that, children who don't want to be left with a babysitter. Right. Okay. You, you have to go out. Right. Um, you, know, you don't have to go out for three hours the right. first night. You go for 10 minutes. Right. You and have to you manufacture these opportunities. That's right. You have to create opportunities. And so you go out for a few minutes and come back. Right. And you go out for a half hour and come back. And mm -hmm. then you go out for an hour and you come back. So that the child gets used to you leaving and knowing that, well, she's going to return eventually. Right. Because she always does. Always okay? does. Right. So you have to do it. Um, in, in these little steps, mm -hmm. okay, you can't just leave for the weekend, right. you know, and traumatize the child. Um, and so you take these small steps. So whether it's not wanting to go to school, not wanting to do homework, not wanting to go to bed, not wanting to sleep in their own room, right. all these things are anxiety, uh, symptoms of, of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And you just have to help your child work through them. Mm -hmm. Then we get to school. Right. And one of the, one of the um, people mentioned in this article talks about the 504 accommodations. Right. And I thought that was a wonderful mm -hmm. example of uh, denying your children the opportunity of working through some of these things. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so it you you do want to push, but you want to do you want to push in a protective way. Right. And so it it is a bit of both. Right. Uh, because you you want to sort of secure their emotional stability mm -hmm. while at the same time pushing their boundaries just a little bit so that they can um, get accustomed to and, and learn to experience this. Because again, if if you only deal with the anxiety mm -hmm. through avoidance, right. avoidance is going to be the only solution. Right. And, and so it's going to you know continue to worsen right. as they age. Because what we all want from our children is we want them to be independent mm -hmm. and self-reliant. Right. And if we are constantly accommodating mm -hmm. to their anxiety, then we're not doing our job in making them self-reliant, self-confident, right. um, and and uh, um, self-regulating. Right. So yeah. So so that I think is the is the message for parents. You know, if your kid is struggling with anxiety, if they're overwhelmed with things that they need to do, and and that those those feelings, that anxiety. Can manifest in a number of different ways. Right. It could manifest as anger. It could manifest as depression. It could manifest as avoidance or um, resistance. It, it could manifest in a lot of different ways. In ways that we attribute to other things, they could they may appear oppositional. It's not that they're oppositional; it's that they're avoidant or they're um, anxious. That's right. And there are some cultural differences here right. too, because children who, in a privileged world, mm -hmm. um, tend to become depressed and anxious. Mm -hmm. Children from um, underprivileged children tend to act out when right. they get anxious. Right. And so there are some um, economic or cultural differences right. as to how the anxiety is expressed. Some children act out mm -hmm. and get angry and aggressive because they're anxious. Um, and some children become withdrawn and depressed mm -hmm. when they get anxious. Right. So um, you have... As a parent, you need to read those signals and figure out um, whether right. what what type you're dealing with. 
because we have dealt with, uh, now that we've been doing this for a few years, we the, the children that we used to see who had what we called early onset bipolar disorder, mm -hmm. who were 12 and 13, they are now in their mid-20s. When they come back to us, mm -hmm. a lot of them, the recurring topic is, I was scared. I was right. anxious. I was feeling, I didn't have bipolar disorder right. because they don't have bipolar disorder as adults. Right. But they will say to us, I was absolutely terrified of everything. Yeah. I was scared. Mm -hmm. Scared to take a shower. Scared to go out. But they out. couldn't articulate scared. it. They but couldn't, they couldn't say that. Yeah. Right? And um, so many of the problems that we see in children, are certainly children with autism spectrum mm -hmm. disorder, um, it's the anxiety that overwhelms them. Right. Um, and so we have to be uh, be aware of this. Yeah. Um, Jean Tang, T-E-N-G-E, -E, uh, wrote a wonderful book about the effects of social media. Mm -hmm. And she says in there, there's two things, two points that I want to make. One is there is some link between um, iPhone, uh, smartphone use and um, emotional turmoil. Mm -hmm. uh, depression, anxiety, right. etc. Uh, we don't know exactly what that connection is yet, but there's some link between those two. Mm -hmm. They they seem to be as smartphones increase depression in teens increases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whether it's causal or not, we don't know. Right. Second thing is um and we often forget about this. Some kids are afraid because of terrorism. They right. have, since 9/11 2001. So those kids are 16. Yeah. They have spent their entire lives thinking that at any moment everything could blow up. Right. Okay? Exactly. And we forget that, you know, we grew up in a more tranquil, peaceful world. Right. These kids are growing up in one that they could be kidnapped at any moment, mm -hmm. they could be hauled away. And the, they're the, they're constantly reminded of that. By right. By by the media and and parents, parents and, and you yeah. know. Um uh, uh, Ebola, you know, right, there was right. an Ebola scare and parents, <laughs> we had a friend who wrapped her child in all kinds of medical mm -hmm. things because he was traveling to some athletic event yeah. and he had a mask and, yeah. you know, all this stuff. That kid must have been terrified of, had to have been. I'm going to get on a plane and he's like yeah. 10 years old or 11 mm -hmm. years old. And so uh, we can't underestimate the effect that um, terrorism right. has had on this generation. Absolutely. Unlike any other generation. Right. 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 And so um, multiple factors mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. causing this generation. Now the last thing is, are we creating wimps? Mm -hmm. Are we? I think I, I have a hard time answering the question. Because my impulse is to say yes. That's right. And we all do that. Mm -hmm. And the, the other generation because my dad thought I was a wimp. Right. Okay. Right. And I think my kids are wimps. Right. And my dad's father thought he was a wimp. Right. And by comparison, he was. Right. You know, my dad had many advantages that his father didn't have. Right. Okay. So generationally, right. we all say that the the, the generation after us are, are weak and wimpy. Right. Mm -hmm. And indulged. And, and, Socrates and, said it. And part of that is is our own manufacturing. I mean, how many parents say, and, and the answer is most, say, I want my kids to have the things that I didn't have. Right. Okay, so you're, you're saying, I, I don't want my kids to have to work in the way that I had to work. Right. So by definition, you're saying, I, I want my kids to be less competent sometimes. Less self-reliant. Right. 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 Yeah. So, so, so we are creating. We are, it's, it has to do with our definition of wimp. Right. You know, are we creating wimps? Yes, they can't do some things that we were able to do at our ages, right. but what we're failing to see is that they are able to do things that we weren't able to do. Right. That's and right. because they're able to do things, I mean, how many, you know, when I was growing up, there was never a, um, a, an 18-year-old mayor of a, uh, of a, of a city. Right. There was not, um, you know, people who were in their late teens and early 20s who were making millions of dollars right. uh, through some of these different uh, adventures, adventures and, right. and different things. So they they are able to do things that we weren't able to do, but we tend to devalue those things. Right. We are not working. They don't have any value for us. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. He's not working. He's a YouTuber. He's not working. Right. Well, right. YouTubing, as we are, we are learning, learning from right. our own YouTube experiences, it, that's it's a tough it's tough thing easy. to figure out how right. to get to that point. So right. it, it has to do with our definition of wimp. Right. That's right. So, so um, 
when when she talks about these 504 accommodations, and I think that's a good example, parents know that you can get these accommodations, you can extra time on tests and mm-hmm. extra this and extra that. Mm-hmm. But maybe it's time for us to help our children deal with that right. rather than look for an accommodation. Right. Because while colleges will accommodate, mm-hmm. uh, they have students with disability mm-hmm. services, Colleges will accommodate, but they're not going to accommodate to that extent, right. and you're not going to be there. So it's far better to help your kids manage, right. work through, mm-hmm. overcome these obstacles, rather than look for accommodations. Right. The reason is simple. When you look for an accommodation for your child, the message you're giving your child is you can't do this yourself. Right. You need some kind of advantage. You need right. some kind of accommodation. You need some right. kind of shortcut, because you're not capable of doing this on your own. And right. that's exactly the opposite message that we want to give our children. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. That's the other advantage of helping your children to work through because you want to give them the sense that, yes, you can overcome these obstacles. Yeah, mm-hmm. pushing them with, with the support and right. sort of the scaled uh, exposure. Right, so. right. Mm-hmm. All right. Wow. Is that it? Yeah. That's it. So, um, thanks for listening. Yeah, let us know mm-hmm. if you have any questions or your thoughts yeah. about all of this. Um, a couple of quick announcements as we're getting done. Oh, we yes. are very, very close to launching, and maybe even by next week, we will be launching our new Patreon, Patreon. page. Mm-hmm. Uh, Patreon is a, a fascinating uh, system where people who uh, yeah. uh, consume or enjoy uh, different forms of media, and in our case, it's our podcast and videos and all, uh, you can sponsor or you can contribute to right. the to the development mm-hmm. and the creation of, of, of these pieces. Uh, for us, I know that the podcasts and the, and the videos and things that we do requires a tremendous amount of time, um, which is why we're, we you know started recording this podcast at about right. 5.30 on Friday morning, right. um, because we, are, we work to do it around our schedule so that you know it doesn't interfere with seeing patients and, mm-hmm. and doing those kinds of things. Uh, and there will be another couple of hours of putting all these podcasts and videos together and editing them and all that kind of stuff. So we're looking for, we're, we're creating yeah. the Patreon page to help create some support so that we can get somebody to help us do that. So that right. we can, um, not so that we can get off easy, but so that we can do more. We, we have a lot more that we want to do. We, we've been meeting over the past week, creating a lot of new ideas right. and new plans that we want to, to work toward. Uh, but we just need time. We, we, we know what, We've done enough of these podcasts now. We know what improvements we want to make. But the improvements are time intensive. And we simply, there aren't enough hours in our day to do everything. And so we're we're looking to get a little bit of assistance. Mm -hmm. We we want to make these better. And we know exactly how we want to do that. But we need a little bit of help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so we will have the Patreon page posted. Again, probably uh, next week we'll have it launched and ready to go. Um, with fingers crossed, and uh, but it'll be it'll be exciting. The other yeah. thing is is that we're we're working on art, new art, and new music, and all of mm-hmm. that to just to kind of revamp the whole thing. Yeah. And we should be kicking that off before um, certainly before the end of the year, yeah. uh, so that, that we can start together. 2018 mm-hmm. all fresh and new. But before then, the best way that you can help us and sponsor and, 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 and just get the information out is by doing a rating, a review on, on iTunes or, you mm-hmm. know, sharing our you know, YouTube channel with your friends, anybody that you think could benefit from anything that we're talking about. Um, again, writing a rating or review on iTunes uh, really helps out to get the information out there so right. other people uh, find us and can can join in and be part of what right. we're trying to build here. Yeah, if you're one of our students, um, please give us a review. Okay, That's we would right. love to hear from you. We want to hear from you, but it also um, it also pays d- dividends to right. us. Uh, right. Not financial dividends, but it moves us up. You understand about that stuff. Yeah. How it moves you up in the in the queue. And yeah. so, please write a review. Take a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. Yeah, there's a link okay. in the show notes to to the iTunes so that you can do it there, or to YouTube so you can, you know, right. share us uh, from there so uh, that other people can find us. All right. Yeah. What was the other thing? I was, was there one other thing I was going to say. I don't know. I forgot what it is. Well, it's about. There you have it. No, can't remember. All right. That is it. Of all the have things. A, have a great. 
rest of your day. And so we'll be back next week with some more information. Oh, we have some good ones next week. Yes, we do. Yeah, there's a good lineup for next week. So stay tuned. Absolutely. Uh, Lots of good stuff coming out. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. We said by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. It's Uh mid-November. I can't remember that. I know, but November's going by quickly. So we want you to stay tuned, but go ahead and make those... Uh, reviews. Yes. Okay, don't wait. That'd be Make great. Reviews we want to, before the end of the year. Absolutely. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid. Mm-hmm.